Welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Barbara Myers. One of the false ideas about people with mental illness is that they have nothing to contribute to society. On this show, we will challenge this by talking about some famous people who had mental illness and did much to enrich our world. I want to acknowledge research on these people that was done by Karen Ilka, a member of the Pool of Consumer Champions. Thank you, Karen, for your work. Helping me to present the information are two friends, Andrea Schechter and Dave Fischbaugh. We will focus on six people, Vincent Van Gogh, Edgar Allan Poe, Emily Dickinson, Peter Tchaikovsky, John Nash, and Patty Duke. So we'll start first with Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh was born in 1853 in the southern part of the Netherlands. His father was a minister in the Dutch Reformed Church, and as a child, he was highly emotional and lacked self-confidence. Dropping out of school at age 16, Vincent worked for seven years as an art dealer in his uncle's businesses in The Hague, London, and Paris. Wanting to become a preacher, Van Gogh tried but failed at Divinity School because his teachers were convinced that he lacked the right qualities. He was determined, however, and worked in a poverty-stricken, dreary coal mining town in the south of Belgium. There he lived as a pauper, giving away his clothes and sharing his food with the miners. He suffered a serious depression. Van Gogh started drawing peasants in 1880 when he was 27 years old, writing, in spite of everything, I will take up my pencil and I will go on with my drawing. When he was 28, Vincent returned to The Hague where his brother Theo was working in the art gallery. He convinced Theo to support him financially while he learned how to paint and develop his artistic skills. And Theo ended up supporting his brother for the rest of his life. Van Gogh's first masterpiece was The Potato Eaters, done in 1885 when he was 32 years old. He went to Paris and saw the work of other modern artists, including the Impressionists. This influenced him to brighten his previous dark palette. He met many painters and enrolled in a studio for artists. Vincent did not like the pressures of city life and he moved to Arles in the south of France for the brightness of the colors there. And he did many paintings, portraits, orchards in spring, cypress and olive trees, and the wheat fields and the harvest. He liked being in the south, but he also felt lonely and isolated. He rented a house with a room for guests, hoping that other artists would come for support and encouragement of their paintings. Paul Gauguin moved in. Gauguin believed that one should paint from imagination, whereas Vincent wanted to catch the essence of what was in front of him. His life was very chaotic and he was unable to get proper sleep and cope with everyday tasks. A few months after he arrived, Gauguin made plans to leave. Vincent threatened him with a razor and Gauguin went to a hotel for that night. When he went back to his room the next morning, he found Vincent bleeding profusely. Contrary to popular belief, he didn't cut off his entire ear, but a small piece of his earlobe. Vincent went to an asylum for a week of treatment. As he recovered, he wrote to his brother Theo, it astonishes me when I compare myself to a month ago. I knew well enough that one could fracture one's arm or legs and recover afterward, but I didn't know that you could fracture the brain in your head and recover from that too. After he had another breakdown where he was obsessed with fears that he was being poisoned, he decided to move out of his house and into an asylum for treatment because it was difficult for him to look after himself. There he alternated between fits of madness and lucidity. He was suffering from acute mania and, and severe depression, so awful that he wanted to take his life. He decided to move to Auvers, a village near to his brother Theo. The last few weeks before he moved, 
he did some of his best work, including Starry Night. After he moved, his hopes were high, and he did well for a couple of months. He completed an average of one painting a day. Two months after he moved to Auvers, where he lived on his own, Vincent climbed into the wheat fields that he had painted so often, and he shot himself in the stomach. Two days later, he died. This was 1890, and he was only 37 years old. His finest works were produced in less than three years, and sadly, he sold only one painting in his lifetime. Edgar Allan Poe is one of America's greatest poets and short story authors. He was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1809 of parents who were both traveling actors. Shortly after his birth, his father disappeared, and within a year, his mother died of pneumonia. The young orphan was taken in by a wealthy merchant named John Allen. Edgar Allan Poe wrote his first poem at the age of 12. When he was 17, he attended the University of Virginia for almost a year, but he took on gambling debts and had problems with drinking, thereby incurring the wrath of his benefactor, Mr. Allen. At the age of 18, he ran away from home, but that year he also published his first book of poetry. At Mr. Allen's urging, young Edgar entered the West Point Military Academy, but he was dismissed from there after only six months for deliberately neglecting his duties. This event ended the difficult relationship between John Allen and Edgar Poe. Allen refused to support Poe anymore, even when at times Poe begged for money after becoming sick and impoverished. When he was 24, Poe won a short story contest and earned $50. This was the beginning of a career as a short story writer, poet, essayist, proofreader, editor, and critic. At times, he was active and prolific, while at other times, he was very depressed. Even when he was writing and publishing much of his work, he experienced bouts of depression and melancholy. His breakdowns were followed by subsequent recoveries. At the age of 27, he married his 13-year-old cousin and lived with her family. But she was in frail health all through their marriage, in a marriage that lasted for nine years until she died of tuberculosis. Poe was overcome with grief and attempted suicide. During much of the marriage, he had been an affectionate husband and son-in-law. He was idealistic, a pleasant companion, and had a good sense of humor. Yet, at other times, he became irritable, critical, unstable, preoccupied with harrowing nightmares, with images of terror and profound sadness. At the age of 36, he published the poem, The Raven, and became a literary celebrity. He never made much money, but his talents were recognized and appreciated, even abroad. His writing was influenced by the popularity of 18th century Gothic stories. Uh, he wrote himself such gripping tales as The Fall of the House of Usher, The Telltale Heart, and The Pit and the Pendulum. In 1841, he wrote The Murder in the Rue Morgue, and it's regarded as the first detective story. And these stories later influenced such writers as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, and the enduring favorite mystery author, Agatha Christie. In 1849, when Edgar Allan Poe was just 40, he was found injured and sick, taken to the hospital where he died four days later. Today, we would recognize that Poe struggled throughout his life with an untreated bipolar disorder. To honor his remarkable gifts and the contributions that he made to American literature, here's an excerpt from Poe's famous poem, The Raven, in 1845. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, 
tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, uh, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly, I wished the morrow. Vainly, I had sought to borrow from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken sad uncertain rustling of, of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is and nothing more. Emily Dickinson was born in Amherst, Massachusetts in 1830. She attended Amherst Academy for seven years during her youth, and she spent a short time in a female seminary. When she was 25, the principal of Amherst Academy, to whom she'd been very close, died. Two years later, she still talked about her depression over that incident. She lived with her parents and a sister and her family. In the 1860s, at age 32, she began to write poetry. She had an unconventional style using free short sentences, unusual punctuation, and unexpected capital letters. With her gift of imagination, she could describe by just a few touches the very crisis of physical or mental struggle. She wore white dresses and had red hair. She isolated herself from the world and had a very secluded adulthood. When she withdrew from social life, her writing became very productive. When people came to her house, she would speak to them with the door cracked, not face to face. She'd stay in her room for long periods. The only time she went outside was to walk in the garden and only within her father's grounds where she felt safe. We would now say that she had agoraphobia or the fear of open places. When she was 44, her father died of a stroke and then the next year her mother had a stroke and a loss of memory and Emily attended to her mother for seven years until she died. Emily herself died in 1886 at the age of 56 of Bright's disease, which caused the degeneration of her kidneys. Altogether, she wrote 1,800 poems, but fewer than 10 were published in her lifetime. After her death, her sister found boxes containing hundreds of her poems. She published the first of them in 1890, four years after Emily died, and more in 1891 and 1896. Emily's poems being published was hailed as a literary event, with one writer saying the poetry's quality is that of extraordinary grasp and insight. By the 1920s, Dickinson was being referred to by various critics as a great woman poet. Emily Dickinson is now considered a powerful and persistent figure in American culture. Her poetry is taught in American literature and poetry classes in the United States and from classes all the way from middle school through college. The Tony winning play in 1976, The Bell of Amherst, is based on her life. I'll give you just a touch of a couple of her poems here. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life from the aching or cool one pain or help one fainting robin into his nest again, I shall not live in vain and the second poem called Compensation. For each ecstatic instant, we must an anguish pay in keen and quivering ratio to the ecstasy for each beloved hour, sharp pittances of years, bitter contested farthings and coffers heaped with tears. Tchaikovsky was born in 1840, 60 miles east of Moscow in Russia. When he was 14, his mother, to whom he was very close, died. He was a delicate and fragile and sensitive child. When he was 10, he went to a performance of Don Giovanni, an opera written by Mozart. 
he was awed by the beauty and the rapture of the performance, and he decided then to devote his life to music. He took piano lessons when he was 18, but was urged not to pursue a career in music. Undaunted, he entered the Moscow Conservatory. When writing his first symphony at the age of 26, he had a crisis of nerves, and he said, I'm on the brink of a nervous breakdown. One, I cannot go on with this symphony. Two, people have noticed that I'm oversensitive and amuse themselves with needling me. And three, I'm going to die very soon before finishing the symphony. He did push on, however, and finish it, but it was received with total indifference. He wrote an opera called The Dream of the Volga, and it was a dismal flop. He was often emotionally overwhelmed. He said, a simple Russian landscape, an evening walk in the summer, across the land, through the forest or over the steppes, makes me so emotional that I stretch myself on the ground, seized by a silent paralysis, an overwhelming feeling of, for nature, totally upset by the dizzying scenes all around me. <clears throat> Tchaikovsky was a homosexual. In order to hide this fact from society, he decided to marry a woman admirer when he was 37 years old. Right away, he could see that this was a mistake. She wouldn't give him a divorce, at, but now she knew his secret. Feeling trapped, he made a suicide attempt. But his career was catching on. He had a benefactress who supported him financially. He went to Europe, had many successes, and became very popular. He got to know all the famous composers of that time. Strauss, Dvorak, Brahms, Grieg, Bizet, Mazursky, Rimsky-Korsakov, and Mahler. He wrote symphonies, operas, instrumentals, chamber music, and songs, some of which were successes and some of which were not. Some of his most popular pieces including, included the ballet Sleeping Beauty, another ballet, The Nutcracker, and Swan Lake, his sixth symphony, The Pathétique, the 1812 Overture, and his piano concerto number no. one. His success was being rewarded. He visited the U.S. when he was 51, and he received an honorary doctorate from Cambridge University in England. The Tsar awarded him a lifetime pension. Although he enjoyed many popular successes, he was never emotionally secure, and his life was punctuated by personal crises and periods of depression, often severe and debilitating. He would go through what was known as rest cures to get better. He was a man of strong feelings, abundant musical talent, and secret personal sorrow. He died in 1893 at only 53 years old. There are different accounts of his death. One was that he died of cholera, and one that he committed suicide. Today we would say that he struggled all of his life with depression. to uh, the 20th century now with our individuals. Uh, John Forbes Nash Jr. is an American mathematician and economist whose theories are in use today in market economics, computing, accounting, and military theory. 
He was the subject of the 2002 Academy Award winning film, A Beautiful Mind, that tells the story of his remarkable mathematical genius and his long struggle with paranoid schizophrenia. John Nash was born in 1928 in Bluefield, West Virginia. His sister Martha recalled that Johnny was always different. Mother insisted I do things for him, that I include him in my friendships, but I wasn't too keen on showing off my somewhat odd brother. He went to college at the Carnegie Institute of Technology in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he studied mathematics. He received both his bachelor's and master's degrees from Carnegie Tech when he was only 20, and he then went on to Princeton University, where he earned his doctorate in a mere two years at the age of 22. A year later, in 1951, Nash went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, as an instructor in mathematics. And while there, he met a physics student from El Salvador, Alicia Lopez Harrison de Larde. The two were married in 1957 and had a son in 1959. By then, however, Nash was showing signs of extreme paranoia and began speaking of characters who were putting him in danger. He believed there was an organization chasing him. He mailed letters to foreign embassies in Washington, D.C., declaring that he was establishing a world government. His wife, Alicia, had Nash involuntarily committed to a mental hospital for one month in 1959. While there, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and depression. Over most of the next nine years, he was in and out of psychiatric hospitals and received antipsychotic medications and insulin shock therapy. Gradually on his own, he was able to intellectually reject his delusional ideas and find ways to cope with his schizophrenia. After 1970, he was never committed to a hospital again and refused medications. In 1994, John Nash received the Nobel Prize in Economics, along with two others, as a result of the work they did in game theory while he was a doctoral student at Princeton University. And between 1945 and 1996, Nash published 23 scientific articles. He developed theories on the role of money in society and made groundbreaking discoveries in real algebraic geometry. He has also advanced evolutionary psychology theory about the value of diversity and the potential benefits of unusual behaviors or roles. And today, John Nash is 81 years old. Patty Duke has acted on the stage in movies and on television. Beginning her career at age eight, she won an Oscar at the age 12 for her role as Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker. And she also has won three Emmys. She was born Anna Marie Duke in December of 1946. She was the youngest of three children. Her alcoholic father left home when she was six, and she rarely saw him after that. Her mother, after several hospitalizations, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Ethel and John Ross became her managers, recognizing her talent, promoting her as a child actress, and having her live with them. They insisted that she change her name to Patty and told her that Anna Marie was dead. They squandered most of the money she made, giving only small amounts to her and her mother. Her time with the Rosses was a very troubled time for her. At a young age, she had panic attacks over the fear of dying. She would hyperventilate, scream, and run. She made up excuses to explain these attacks and learned to cough and clear her throat so she wouldn't scream. Her depression started when she was 16 doing the Patty Duke show on TV. During the three-year run of the show, she worked from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. five days a week. Working helped her to feel better, but often she would spend Friday nights to Monday mornings in bed very depressed and crying. Later, her depressions lasted up to six weeks, where she barely got out of bed and felt suicidal. 
Patty's first manic episode was caused by anesthesia she was given for an emergency appendectomy. After that, she would fluctuate between depression and manic episodes where she was hallucinating, ranting, screaming, breaking things, and doing things that she didn't normally do, like spending lots of money. In and out of psychiatric hospital wards, on and off for the next 15 years, she kept acting with support of her family managers and friends. During this time, she married three times and had two children. Receiving a diagnosis of manic depression was a relief to her because she could see the cause of her bizarre behavior. She started taking lithium and it helped her. When she was 40, she decided to use her celebrity status to spread the word about manic depression, writing two books about her life and giving many speeches and interviewed. She is now married to her fourth husband, Michael Pierce, and they have a son. She is still acting and her current role is that of Madame Morrible in the musical Wicked now playing in San Francisco. Only after I was diagnosed did I become aware that I expressed myself creatively. I noticed I was funny, that I could tell stories in a colorful way that made people laugh. I began to respect my command of language and my ability to communicate. I'm able to be more inspired now when I read a script about how to interpret a role or when I sit down with a blank piece of paper to write a speech. I know that without treatment, I would never be able to harness my creativity in such a successful way. There are many other artists, actors, writers, and so forth. Does it surprise you that so many extremely talented people are touched with mental challenges? If you're like most people, you probably admire one or more of these gifted people who happen to have mental illness. I suggest that you try to learn more about them and the challenging mental health situations that they lived with. And the next time you hear it said that people with mental illness don't contribute to society, you'll be able to say that you know better. I'll end with the uh, closing words by the Reverend Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.